Okay, so let's get started APA style and academic academic integrity. Uh, kind of go together, kind of don't. Uh, they kind of pragmatic pragmatically fit together. So that's but this is information that you probably need. So what we're going to be talking about today, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the outline of topics, I'm going to talk about. No, I don't want that. I want my there we go pen going to be talking about pre-writing uh, writing basics technical style APA style and academic integrity uh, introduction I think I said the introduction about how they don't the topics don't fit together but they kind of do uh, but remember that psych 430 is a uh, you're writing intensive course and so we're going to be working on writing and one major part of that is you folks learning how to write in technical style and in APA style and write appropriately for psych majors. So on to the outline. Pre-writing. Uh, so I'm going to break this down into just outlining articles and uh, making notes for articles. Uh, but first, a uh, quote from Mark Twain write what you know and oftentimes you know that's advice for beginning writers write what you know uh, don't try to copy other writers styles uh, that's what you always hear when you're learning how to write and I think the same is true when you know psychology uh, in that uh, you know uh, students often will try to uh, you know write like they see in journals and what that means is that they really are trying to copy the style but not really understand what's going on and write it in their own words and when uh, a student is trying to copy a style uh, what that means is they really are not understanding what's going on and it's only by chance that they actually say the right thing and so I, I would say that this is true in psychology you should just write what you know and so make sure that you know what you're writing about and with that being said then we need to talk about the rest of pre-writing that is preparing yourself to write and outlining articles as I think a, a very important uh, idea and that is you have an article a research article that you need to understand and it's not coming to you most students I know would then just give up uh, but here's a, a very simple technique outline the article how do you outline it you copy verbatim the first sentence of a paragraph and the last sentence of a paragraph so for every paragraph you copy the first sentence and the last sentence uh, you can do this by hand you can type it up uh, I wouldn't recommend cutting and pasting it it's much easier but then you don't really interact with the words uh, you don't uh, get a feel for the flow of words in APA style and technical writing and uh, you don't really pick up the content of the article and so uh, this is for uh, Pinner and Kale's article uh, this is the first uh, sentence of the article Goffman argued that the concept of stigma could integrate much of the theoretical work on blah 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 and so then another paragraph I'm uh, you know uh, outlining here's the first sentence of the paragraph verbatim and then uh, there was stuff material in the body of the paragraph I thought was important so I just added those as notes what attribution is uh, what labeling is what ambivalence is and then here's the last sentence of the paragraph and so that's how I would go about doing outlining and another example of outlining okay then once you have it outlined you can go back over your outline and take notes uh, you should you know organize it by the APA style in uh, text citation the research question that is the uh, you know uh, topic or the theme of the research research study uh, the predictions and the hypotheses, the IVs, the DVs, and you notice how long this is. 
population and sampling procedure, uh, procedure, and the results. And if you have a study with more than one experiment, do this for each experiment. It is that high. Okay, so writing basics, uh, the paragraph, technical writing, and APA style. Uh, the paragraph, the par a paragraph has three parts, and each part serves one of three different functions. Paragraph should have a first sentence which introduces the reader to the topic of the paragraph. Sometimes the first sentence will be a paragraph hook or another type of transition which helps the reader follow the jump between the preceding paragraph and the current paragraph. The middle sentences of the paragraph are called body sentences and they should all support the uh, topic presented. Okay, my wife got a phone call so I don't know where I stopped. Uh, the body sentences, besides supporting the topic sentence, provide your reader with the information you wish to convey. Finally, the last sentence is, uh, in the paragraph is a concluding sentence. The concluding sentence recalls the topic sentence and some information of the body sentences. The three parts of the paragraph, the topic, body, and concluding sentences work together to help you express your ideas. Come on, go forward. There we go. And so you see what I did there? Uh, topic sentence, body sentences, concluding sentences. And so that's the way a structured paragraph should always look. And oftentimes in comments, I'll say, you know, I, you, know you need to have a structured paragraph. Or based on this topic sentence, it means that this paragraph is going to be about this topic, but it's about another topic. And so always have a topic sentence, and then you have several ideas that support that topic sentence, and you bring them all back together in the concluding sentence. And never, no, never write in a serial fashion like that, where you go from one idea to another idea to another idea, and then you go to the next paragraph. That will leave your uh, audience very confused and not really satisfied. Okay, moving on to technical writing. Uh, in technical writing, it's just the facts, ma'am. And so the tone of the paper should be objective rather than subjective. And that's basically what technical writing is. And there's, you know, it's just more of the same uh, you know, elaborating on that basic idea, but I'll do that. And I need to do that because in English 125, you've been in high school, you've been taught to write in a non-technical style uh, because English professors have uh, taught you how to write. So uh, you are going to be writing in that type of style. Uh, so, uh, you know, what you need to do is start to think about removing your personal thoughts, your personal feelings, or your personal observations from your writing. And that will make it a good technical paper. And it literally is just the facts, ma'am. Another element of uh, technical writing is that you're going to be descriptive rather than summative. That is, a summative statement about an experiment would be most of the sample was male. Well, what does most mean? That's a subjective term. We want to have objective terms such as there is 25 males and 5 females. So we want to be descriptive and objective. We do not want to summarize and especially we do not want to summarize in a subjective way. Finally, we want to be concise and brief. We want to use the easiest word to describe what we want to describe. Uh, and we do not want to add in flower, flowery, flowery language that really doesn't aid in the technical expression of an idea. Uh, I often put this in uh, lab assignments when I'm, uh, you know, earlier in the semester. Uh, technical writing, avoid the subjective, embrace, um, embrace objectivity, be impersonal. Uh, in a lot of ways, you should not be in a, technical, a technically written paper. Uh, just the facts, ma'am, but all of the facts. 
Uh, avoid a diary style. Uh, don't describe your activity or thoughts. That is, I did this, I did this in the experiment. That's not what you should do. Uh, consider your audience's needs. And our audiences are going to be assumed to have technical knowledge, that is, statistics and research methods knowledge, at a master's degree level or above. Uh, they will have general knowledge about psychology at a master's level, uh, but you can assume that they are ignorant of the specific subject. So if you're writing about defensive attributions, uh, you can assume that they understand what you know, attribution theory is, because that's something we cover in uh, you know, social psych here at the undergraduate level. Uh, but you can assume that they understand uh, what a matched pair design is, or what an analysis of variance is. And a couple final tips for first-time technical writers. Avoid writing in simple sentences. Students who usually take what I've been saying to heart and try to write in a technical style end up writing in a series of uh, simple sentences, and that makes it very difficult to read because it's very choppy. And so uh, this is a good time uh, to start focusing on redrafting. So write a first draft and then go back over that first draft and look for sentence, simple sentences and then redraft and combine those simple sentences into more complex sentences. Also another mistake students make when they try to write technically is that they write in passive voice. And what is passive voice? Well, if you can add by zombies after the verb, uh, then it's uh, passive voice. So we'll say questionnaires were distributed by zombies. Yeah, that works. So that's passive voice. Uh, so we want to rewrite it. Uh, the researchers distributed questionnaires. And we know who distributed the questionnaires, so that's not passive voice. Uh, and of course, it is more complete because now we know who distributed the questionnaires. This original sentence here, the questionnaires were distributed, you just say, well, by who? By volunteers, by researchers, by students. Now we, we know exactly who did that. And almost finally, APA style. So APA style, the American Psychological Association, is psychology's technical style. Uh, APA style is a technical style of writing and there are very very specific rules to follow and the reason why is then the more rules the easier it is to read each article because you know exactly where to look in each article to find things you have a schema for the article and you understand what's going to uh, you know what's going to happen so we're at our seventh edition it just came out this year and so I bought a copy of both the publication manual uh, and I did buy it in the spiral binding because I'm always wanting to hold the book open to different pages when I'm working on it. And then I also uh, bought a copy of the student version that is the style guide for students. Uh, you may wish to consider this. It's around uh, 30 bucks. Uh, but we have a lot of online examples that give us most of what we need. Need, For example, uh, the OWL site at Purdue University uh, is one that I recommend to students uh, because it really does a good job of providing an overview of the you know, uh, rules of APA style. Also in your other classes in psychology and uh, especially 330, uh, you should have been introduced to APA style. So therefore, I don't see really buying uh, the student version is that critical. Uh, but if you have a, plans for a career in psychology, you may want to buy the student version and or the publication manual. Uh, so some general issues that uh, students uh, miss. Uh, you cite all, all sources and only uh, cited sources in the text go in the reference list. That is, the reference list is a reference list, not a bibliography. A bibliography 
includes articles that you cited or books you cited and books you suggest that are going to be read. Uh, the reference list only contains articles you cited, so it's an equal sign. You cited something, it must be in the reference list. If it's in the reference list, you had to have cited it. And uh, in you know APA style, we set up the in-text citations like this. That is past studies and then parentheses. Smith and James, comma, 2009 have shown, or Smith and uh, James, comma, parentheses, 2009 have shown, dot, dot, dot. Uh, that's how we do the in-text citations. And, of course, you'll hear me talking about in-text uh, and reference citations. And they're different. Uh, in in insects. In-text citations look exactly like this. The reference citations follow very specific rules that you'll find in the APA style guide or on the OWL site. And our final topic for today, academic integrity. Uh, students will often accidentally uh, you know, plagiarize, uh, which is a violation of academic integrity. And so what I'd like to do is be very clear at the beginning of the semester about what that is and uh, make sure that you understand that if you write something and submit it to, to me in class, it must be your own work. And anything not your work is going to be cited appropriately. And that's the basic rules. Uh, so I know that you all have heard that before, but so how can you avoid making mistakes and inadvertently uh, plagiarizing? Well, the first rule is avoid cut and pasting from the internet and other sources. Uh, that is, you know, you say to yourself, well, uh, I, how else can you say this statement? Or I'm going to change a couple words in this statement, or I'll cut and paste it into my paper, and then later on I'll put it in my own words. Those are bad ideas. And so, in general, don't just cut and paste from one, you know, from another source to your paper. Uh, look at what the, uh, you know, uh, article said. Take notes from it, and then once you understand uh, what the article said, describe it in your own words. Uh, in APA style, if you cut and paste, uh, that should be a direct quote. And guess what? Direct quotes are discouraged in APA style. They are discouraged in many technical styles uh, because paraphrasing is usually more concise and more direct and more helpful to the reader. And so that's why we uh, encourage paraphrasing over direct quotes. But even if you paraphrase, you must cite the source that you're paraphrasing from. Ooh, that looks horrible. Uh, so let's look at a, an example of cut and paste plagiarism. Uh, this was from a student's paper, and you take a second to read it, stop uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, video. And then this is from a website on the internet. And what the student did is they took this website and they changed it uh, to become this paragraph. And uh, while they did change it, they did not cite the uh, web page that they used. So this is, this is an example of plagiarism. Uh, they said that they were citing uh, the Kelly article, and then I assume they were citing DSM, uh, but they didn't cite DSM, they just uh, identified it. Uh, so uh, that is what the students writing led me to believe, but that was untrue. They were actually using somebody else's work and ideas. And when you're using somebody else's works and ideas, you should give them proper credit. So proper credit should have been given to the uh, web page, which, you know, of course, is really an, an inappropriate uh, citation source. So whether or not the student themselves knew they were uh, cheating or not, they ended up doing it, and you can cheat accidentally. 
and I understand that and so that's why it's important to go over this uh, so that you know not to accidentally do these things and so a web page is certainly a bad source for information even if you're going to look at the web page and take notes from it and then write it up in your own words that would be a paraphrase of the web page and that still means that you would have to cite the web page and I don't want to see you citing web pages because they're not really appropriate sources of information in most cases. Another version of uh, plagiarism I'm seeing lately is mosaic plagiarism. And this is basically cut and paste plagiarism plus changing a few words. And the way this works is you cut and paste a source into your paper and then you use synonyms in your word processor and just click on the right mouse button and you know choose a synonym or I know that if you want to do it wholesale you can submit the uh, you know, uh, you know uh, page to Google Translate translate it into a couple different languages and then finally back into English and then uh, it is a different uh, you know, set of words, but it's the same idea and the same source that should be uh, cited. And so let me give you a couple examples of this. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, a paragraph by uh, Gavaller and Johnson. Uh, Kitten uh, Castano, Castano's study contained four implicit assumptions. A text cannot be literary, literary and popular. B, a text cannot be literary and also a sub uh, genius. Uh, genre uh, because the literariness of literary fiction is uh, the theory of mind uh, promotion and you know read the rest of this okay so uh, I could cut and paste this from the article into my word processor and then go through and then every so often randomly more or less just uh, add synonyms and I get this Kitten and uh, Castano's study covers four unspoken ex uh, expectations and you see for implicit assumptions, unspoken expectations. Uh, so I'm just changing the words, not changing the meaning of what's going on. And one problem of this is that it's plagiarism uh, because you are using, uh, you know, Graveller and Johnson's words as a paraphrase, uh, but you're not really communicating that this is a paraphrase. Uh, and uh, also, if you're just randomly choosing synonyms, you may do things that make this unreadable. And in fact, most of the time when I notice mosaic uh, plagiarism, what's going on is that students, uh, you know, a student will change a word that should not be changed, and so now they're talking crazy. And it's very easy to pick that up. And here's the same original uh, paragraph, but I submitted it to uh, a couple different languages in Google Translate, uh, and then uh, you know translated it back into English. So that just took a, a couple mouse clicks. Uh, Kid and Caston uh, uh, study included four distinct things, themes. So four implicit assumptions, four distinct uh, themes and that certainly makes sense in the way it was translated. Writing uh, could not be written or celebrated. Hmm. A text cannot be literary and popular. Uh, the letters may uh, not be letters and may interfere with the text. And here is where a text cannot be literary and also belong to a some genre. Here is where a good example of talking crazy. Uh, this makes absolutely no sense but I've received paragraphs like this to grade. And again, uh, you're shooting yourself in the foot because this doesn't make sense and I'm going to grade it as if it makes no sense uh, and think that you're kind of like wacky or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so <laughs> uh, you just shouldn't do this. But then again, this is a deceptive technique uh, used to basically hide the fact that you're stealing the ideas of uh, you know Graveller and Johnson and you know uh, even if you 
cite it as a paraphrase, you're still going to be in trouble that uh, these meanings have been changed by the procedure that you used, and so I'm going to respond as a greater negatively to that. So how to avoid this? I think I already said this, uh, but it bears repeating. Don't cut and paste. Uh, take notes. Understand what you're writing about. You know, write only what you know, and then just write up what you're thinking. Uh, only direct quotes are you know cut and pasted, and they're putting in uh, you know quotation marks, and they're given a special citation in APA style. But APA style says you should avoid direct quotes, and I really don't want to see any direct quotes this whole semester from anybody. Oh, it's timed. I'm sorry. So, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, the both basically those are APA style rules. So don't do it. The one question I have is in your writing styles, are you taught to use synonyms? Because I've heard a lot of uh, high school teachers and college professors are emphasizing that the thesaurus is your best friend and so you should always be trying to use different words or use more complex words. And I don't really agree with that. You should use the right word. And if you're just kind of randomly going to a thesaurus and changing words, uh, then you're not using the correct, the exact word that you should use. And in a technical style, or even a non-technical style, the meaning of different, you know, of different synonyms is critically important. And so you should not be doing that. And hopefully we'll discuss that in class. Uh, so. Did I already include this? I think I already included this. This is a duplicate. Uh, but citing each other's work. Oh, no, I didn't do this. I just remember it from when I you know, proofread this. Uh, do not list the title. I can't believe I'm saying this because this is the basic of APA style. But in terms of the in-text citations, do not list the title of the article. Uh, we. Uh, basically cite by the author's last names and the year of publication. Uh, we avoid direct quotes, as I've said before, and more, issue, uh, more info is here at the OWL site at Purdue University. And so let me give you a positive example of uh, you know, writing up something in APA style. So here's a, a paragraph from a paper, and you may want to stop and uh, you know, take a look at it. And so you write up this description of it. In their second experiment, the researchers were interested in the degree to which the essay writer's attitude would influence the observer's ratings. They predicted that there would be no relationship between the writer's attitude and the observer's ratings. This prediction was based upon the conclusions of previous, several previous experiments. And that is not exactly what we have here. And you can see that many things have been left out. That is, the observers were blind. That was left out because that was not really critical to what the author wanted to get across here. Uh, that's the benefit of writing your own text. For your paper and or a lab, you're going to have different motivations or different goals for your writing. And so just kind of paraphrasing everything or you know, direct quoting everything, uh, cut and pasting everything, you're not going to have the correct direction or focus for your, uh, you know, uh, paragraph. And so it's not going to work well, even if we're not talking about plagiarism or anything like that, we're talking about good writing. So good writing is not paraphrasing or cut and pasting. Uh, so you basically focus on what you want to get across, and that may change from context to context. Uh, so you want to cite this, and so in their second experiment, Miller, Ashton, and Michelle, 1990, uh, and were interested in the degree to which the essay writer's attitudes would influence the observer's ratings. And so this is one version of the citation style in APA style. You list the author's name, so you're talking about the authors and what they did. 
you just put the year it was published in parentheses. So if there are more uh, articles by Miller, Ashton, and Michal, sorry, uh, then you will know which one you're referring to. Or you could just put the citation information at the end of the paragraph in all in parentheses and not change anything. And this indicates that everything in this paragraph is attributable to Ashton uh, Miller, Ashton, and Michelle. And, you know, that is, I'm sorry, the timer's on. Uh, let me just stop the recording and turn. No, I can't do that. I just remembered, so I'm back. Uh, so, and then finally, a bad direct quote. So you could say something like this. In their second experiment, Miller, Ashton, and Michelle, 1990, were interested in, quote, Observers, blind with the respect to the writer's personal attitudes, ex assess the essays written in experiment one. Uh, blah, blah, blah. End quote. Page number. Now, giving the page number means that you've formed, and also the names of the researcher and the year of the publication, you have formed a legitimate APA-style direct quote. However, this is bad, and one reason why it's bad is it contains a lot of information that I thought when writing it up was not useful to what I was trying to do. I didn't care about whether they were blind or not. I didn't care about which uh, essays or where the essays were generated from. Uh, you know, I didn't want to use some of the terminology of the original authors. And I didn't care about talking about the topic of the essays. So this is a direct quote. It's not plagiarism, but it's just bad writing style, and it would be graded uh, appropriately. And oh, we're done. Uh, this, by the way, we had a mouse sentence, census uh, for my cat. She had 99 mice. What a lucky girl. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.